Good afternoon, everyone. I am Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, and today committee will hold a hearing on Intro 1300, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to public access to noise mitigation plans. Intro 1653, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to responses to noise complaints. And Resolution 17, uh, uh, 1173, calling on the United States Congress to pass and the President to sign legislation that would require the Federal Aviation Administration to reduce the threshold for what constitutes a, a significant noise impact under the Federal Aviation Regulation Part 150, from 65 day-night decibels to 55 day-night decibels. Noise continues to be the number one quality of life issue in New York City, as evidenced by the number of 311 noise complaints. According to the Mayor's Manager Report for fiscal 2017, the Department of Environmental Protection received 58,892 noise complaints in FY17. The number of noise complaints has been on the rise over each of the past previous six years, with FY17 having the second most noise complaints in recent years. Noise pollution causes a variety of adverse human health impacts, many of which are related to noise-induced stress, included hearing loss, hypertension, increased cortisol release, sleep disruption, and cognitive impairment. Recent studies have also found that neighborhoods with populations of lower social economic status and higher racial and ethnic minority groups had increased exposure to noise pollution. In 2005, Mayor Bloomberg enacted Local Law 13, uh, 113 of 2005, overhauling the city's noise code for the first time in over 30 years in order to update the code and make it a reflective of modern acoustic technologies and standards. The main goals of 2005 noise code update were to reduce sound from construction, reduce sound from commercial music sources, regulate noise from air conditioning devices more effectively, make enforcement of noise code simpler, and to legislatively establish limits sources of noise. The noise code is, de is designed to reduce the making, creating, and maintenance of excessive, unreasonable, and prohibited noises. DEP and the City's Police Department, NYPD, share responsibility for enforcing the noise code depending on the nature of the noise complaint that is received. Under the existing noise code, the statutorily set noise limits include sound that is 7 decibels or more above ambient sound level between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. and sound that is 10 decibels or, or, or more above the ambient sound level between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m an impulsive sound that is 15 decibels or more above the Andean sound level. The noise code contains a section specifically addressing construction noise management. To limit construction noise, the noise code generally permits construction between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. on weekdays. Any construction outside of these hours is considered to be in violation of the noise code unless the New York State Department of Buildings issues an after-hour variance. In August of 2017, uh, the New York State Controller released a report on the effectiveness of DEP and DOB in enforcing the noise code in relation to construction projects. The report states that between the audit period of January 1, 2014 to June 30th of 2016, there were 90,861 construction-related noise complaints addressed through the city's 311 system. Of these, 67,282, or 74%, were outside of the noise code's permitted hours of 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. on weekdays. During this period, the DOB, DOB issued 138,302 AHVs. The State Controller Report found that, that despite the rising number of construction noise complaints through 311, neither DEB, DEP or DOB used the system to locate uh, identify locations and major sources of noise complaints. In addition, DOB issued multiple H AHVs or extensions of existing AHVs for construction sites without taking a thorough review, including whether the construction site had received any 311 noise complaints or whether DEP had issued construction noise citations. The controller made a number of recommendations. 
including improving communication and coordination with DOB such that pertinent AHV and permit data is made more readily available to DEP inspectors. Both introductions, if enacted, would improve enforcement, efficiency, and transparency as New York City grapples with measures that can make it more quiet enough to sleep in a city that never sleeps. Airplane noise also interrupts the sleep of many New York City residents. As someone who represents a district adjacent to LaGuardia Airport, I know all too well. For more than a decade, airplane noise has steadily increased much over the borough of Queens. In Northeast Queens, airplane departures from LaGuardia increased from 50,000 in 2002 to some 100,000 in 2016. In addition, recent decisions by the Federal Aviation Administration to reroute several <clears throat> flight patterns in and out of LaGuardia Airport have led to significant noise pollution from morning to night for many residents of Queens. Resolution 1177 calls on the United States Congress to pass in the President to sign legislation that will require the Federal Aviation Administration to reduce the threshold for what constitutes a significant noise impact under the Federal Aviation Regulation Part 150, Airpoint Noise Compatibility Planning Program from 65 day per day night decibels to 50 five day-night decibels. This resolution has the strong support of our esteemed Congressperson Grace Meng and uh, both Congressmember Meng and Congressmember Crowley <clears throat> have been strong advocates in helping to make Queens quieter. Protecting the environmental quality of New York City from noise pollution in urban areas is an important part of the work of this committee. These pieces of legislation are intended to reduce the impacts of noise pollution and improve the quality of life for New York City residents. Now we will hear from council members uh, both Dan Gorodnik and Ben Kalos on their bills. I also want to recognize that we have uh, both uh, council members Eric Ulrich and Donovan Richards of the committee here today. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, both first uh, council member Gorodnik and then council member Kalos. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair Constantine Antonides, for uh, holding a hearing today on Intro 1300, which, as you noted, is a bill that would require noise mitigation plans to be filed with the Department of Environmental Protection and made publicly available <coughs> on their website and to be posted conspicuously at construction sites. All construction sites today must have a noise mitigation plan associated with their work. These plans contain information such as location, scope of work, timing of the project, construction devices to be used at the site, and what, if any, mitigating materials are required for the use of those devices. However, these plans are not currently publicly available to neighbors of construction sites who wish to stay informed of what kind of noise they can expect. On top of that, the plans aren't even required to be filed with DEP, meaning that any DEP official looking to inspect the plan for compliance must go to the site in person, and even then they may be directed to a construction officer if the plan is not kept at the site. This clunky system is counter to the way most departments throughout the city have been modernizing making significant amounts of documentation and records available online for public perusal. Publishing noise mitigation plans online and requiring them to be filed with DEP would accomplish several goals in one fell swoop. It would bring noise mitigation into line with the rest of the process of filing documents and publishing information for construction projects. It would add transparency and accountability for people affected by construction noise and it would allow DEP to be a more efficient enforcer when there are questions about the level of noise produced by a site. New Yorkers are looking for relief here, and this is one way that we can give it to them. And I look forward to hearing today's testimony, and Mr. Chairman, again, I thank you, and I encourage my colleagues to join me in support of this common sense bill. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gorodnik. Councilmember Kalis. Good afternoon. New York City may be the city that never sleeps, but it doesn't have to be. Noise is the number one complaint in New York City, uh, but it doesn't have to be a fact of life in the bag, Big Apple. With construction booming all over the city, I can literally walk from one block 
from a construction site on one block in my district to the next construction site across the street to the next construction site across the street to the next construction site across the street to the next construction site across the street. And I could go on with the amount of construction that we are seeing in the city. And uh, it is no wonder that along with that comes uh, more noise complaints around construction than anywhere else in the city located on East End Avenue in my district and recently covered in numerous media outlets. And uh, along those lines, I think a lot of residents get concerned when we use 311. Uh, and if 311 worked, all of us elected officials might be out of a job. Uh, but what can sometimes tend to happen, at least from the user aspect, is you put in the 311 complaint, it seems like no one's there to check on that noise right now when I want it fixed in the middle of the night. Uh, according to 301, folks may come as late as four days later, and uh, then they won't actually issue the violation, seeing as the noise may not be actually occurring four days later. And so we introduced this legislation in hopes of setting some sort of timeline. Uh, we have since, and we introduced it with our uh, Environmental Committee Chair Costa Constantinides, who he and his team have been instrumental in working on this. And since then, we've had a chance to amend it so that uh, we can work with the DEP commissioner to set standards for responses along with reporting on how that response works. Along with the, uh, upon introduction, we have hundreds and hundreds of comments in the New York Times, and people were saying, things about what was actually happening on the construction sites and that when there's an after hours variance, they can actually exceed a lot of the noise limits that normally would occur in a normal construction site. So we've uh, used the feedback we've gotten from the entire city as a whole. We are grateful to have such a uh, strong and intelligent constituency. And we look forward to coming together with the best legislation possible that uh, make sure that we respond properly. Uh, one other item we got from the community is it turns out that uh, some neighborhoods are different than one another's. And so what may be appropriate in a commercial and manufacturing neighborhood where no one lives or sleeps uh, might be very different than in a residential neighborhood where folks would like to uh, get some rest after 7 a.m. or uh, might want to get to bed before a no after hours variance expires at 10 or might want to go to synagogue on a Saturday and observe the Shabbos in peace and quiet. And so uh, a bunch of us are lawyers and uh, in law school we learned about quiet enjoyment. It's this thing we have a right to with our law. And so we hope that our law, working with DEP and Department of Buildings, could actually uh, make sure that every New Yorker could enjoy some peace and quiet in this very busy and uh, loud city. I do want to take a moment to thank Jen Wilcox of the Infrastructure Division and Samara Swanson, Environmental Protection Committee Council, for working so closely with us on this legislation. We look forward to working with the administration to hopefully move swiftly on this, and uh, thank you. So with that, we'll turn it over to the Department of Buildings. Uh, so uh, Patrick Whaley, good to see you as always, and Angela Lelicata, I didn't even need the cards, I know you guys. so. Great to see you both. We'll, we'll hit that turn here with this testimony. Oh, yes. Um, do, no. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. I do. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Constantides and members of the committee and the council. I am Angela Licata, Deputy Commissioner of Sustainability at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. I am joined by Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at the Department of Buildings. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of introductions 1300 and 1653A. DEP's mission is to protect public health and the environment by supplying clean drinking water, collecting and treating wastewater, and reducing air noise and hazardous materials pollution. These bills propose to address noise from construction sites, which results in large numbers of complaints to 311. And we welcome the opportunity to work with the Council to better reduce the effects of construction noise on our neighborhoods. 
DEP supports passage of intro 1300, which would require DEP to make all noise mitigation plans from construction sites publicly available by posting on DEP's website and require the posting of noise mitigation plans on the exterior of construction sites. DEP also supports the passage of intro 1653A, which would require DEP to promulgate rules prescribing specific inspection timeframes so that noise inspections occur at times when alleged noise occurs or is repeated, and to require annual reports on response to noise complaints. The features of the bills that we believe will enhance DEP's response and most effectively result in reduction in construction noise include the following. Allowing the Commissioner to set these timeframes for inspection in order to ensure that the responses to complaints occur when the violations are most likely to occur. Requiring that noise mitigation plans and alternative noise mitigation plans be posted on the City's website and authorizing DEP to issue verbal and written stop work orders for specific activities or equipment that require noise exceeding the standard set for, or that create rather noise exceeding the standard set forth by the bill. Now some of these cases will involve after hour variances or AHVs which are required in order to perform construction work outside of the hours between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. AHVs are issued by DOB for reasons that include emergency work, public safety, city managed construction projects, construction activities with minimal noise impact, and undue hardship. The most important and common reason for the issuance of an AHV is public safety, when typically the work can be performed more safely when there is less pedestrian and vehicular traffic. As stated before, we agree with the goals of the bill, but we do have some recommendations on how this legislation might be improved. Such as, the bill should authorize DEP to take readings from street level in front of the sensitive receptor when there is an AHV in effect. Currently, readings may only be taken from inside a complainant's dwelling, thereby slowing our response time. We also suggest that the bill reflect the a language that the readings may be taken from the public right-of-way as described in section 24-228. For AHVs, when a specific mitigation in the noise mitigation plan is not implemented, the current bill requires DOB to rescind or refuse to renew the AHV until the condition is corrected. Given that the bill authorizes DEP to stop work for specific activities or equipment that create noise exceeding the standard, there is no reason to stop all work associated with the AHV, particularly for an AHV with a broad scope of work where much of it does not exceed the noise level standard. We are still reviewing the impacts of several of the bill's amendments, including provisions related to stop work orders, revocation of AHVs, specific decibel level thresholds, and the impact of those thresholds on certain construction projects, including and, most, and specifically street projects and other provisions that would benefit from technical changes. We look forward to further conversations with the Council in order to ensure that the proposed legislation accomplishes the goals of more timely inspections at construction sites and of establishing effective mechanisms to re achieve reasonable noise levels. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and we would be happy to address any questions that you may have. And let me just take this opportunity to also acknowledge the attendance and support of some of my key staff members here. Michael Gilson, Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Environmental Compliance, Jerry Kelpin, the Director of the Air and Noise Enforcement Unit, and her first Deputy Director, Alyssa Preston. Thank you. So I'm going to ask a few questions, but I'm going to turn it over to the sponsors of the bills to ask the majority of the questions. Um, but I guess my question I have on 1300, um, uh, does DEP currently collect uh, all uh, noise mitigation plans from construction sites? No, currently we do not collect the plans. When we go to a site, the plans should be available on the construction site. Over the period of time since um, the code has required noise mitigation plans, we have found the industry has improved to a great extent by um, generally having these con uh, noise mitigation plans available for our inspection. And how often do we inspect to make sure that they're there? We inspect when we receive complaints. We will go to the site and that's <clears> the first 
uh, piece of evidence that we want to see. We want to see a record of the noise mitigation plan on site. Okay. And then on uh, 1653, I'll talk a little bit more about noise generally. Again, I'm going to leave the majority of questions for the sponsors. Uh, how do, you do, how do you coordinate with the Department of Buildings uh, in responding to 311 construction complaints uh, and where DOB has issued these after hours variances? Well, we feel that we have greatly improved our uh, level of coordination between the two agencies. Over the last several years, we've been making it a habit um, to in inform buildings when we have repeat complaints for a particular site. And we may ask them if we find violations or if we find that the uh, noise levels associated with the activity is very problematic for the buildings department to consider not reissuing the AHV. But I'll let Patrick also weigh in on this. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner with the Buildings Department. So just to piggyback on what Angela said, so we now have a process in place where if DEP receives a complaint, performs an inspection, and upon that inspection they see a violation of the noise mitigation plan, or maybe they see other work being performed on the site, um, at that point in time that's not in scope with the after hour variance that the department issued, we have a process in place by which um, DEP notifies the department and we use that information to perform our own inspections and we also use complaint information and so forth from DEP to determine whether or not that variance should be um, renewed or rescinded or altered in some way. And what sort of timeline, and so how, how do we streamline that process to make sure that if DEP finds something wrong that you're taking action uh, within a, a good time frame. What's usually the time frame from the time that they let you know that the noise mitigation uh, plan or the, the scope of work is not being done correctly? How soon are you out there to issue a violation and, and so on? Well, once we're informed by DEP, we pretty much start to get to work immediately. We review the actual variance that we issued. We speak with the contractor, whoever the applicant is, to get a better understanding of the work that they're doing. We perform site visits as well. And with all that information, we make a determination as to whether or not the variance um, that was issued was issued appropriately. And how long does that all take? Uh, as a general matter, our service level for after-hour variance complaints, uh, last time I checked, is 17 days. 17. If we receive a complaint directly from DEP, we'll, of course, respond sooner than that. Can we get it? I mean, 17 days seems... A bit long, right? I mean, where you know, if 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 I if I'm living in a building neck with a sleeping baby or a, a sick family member, 17 days is an awful long time to wait. How do we streamline that? Uh, it's, it's really a function of resources, largely. You know, the buildings department has a, a wide breadth of what we are responsible for enforcing. We perform well over 100,000 inspections every year. Mm -hmm. And based on the volume of inspection requests we receive, we're in a position where we need to triage those inspections. So those inspections that are more of an emergency nature, mm -hmm. we treat as a category A complaint. We get out there far sooner. And other types of complaints, like in this case, an after hour variance complaint, we treat as a type uh, category B complaint. And currently for our B complaints, we're getting out there within 17 days. And in certain instances, we'll prioritize those complaints. So this is something we're going to have to work on the next city budget, try to get you some more folks so we, we can reduce that number, right? <laughs> I mean, 17 days just seems a little bit long to... If I'm filing a complaint today, when, I mean, the way I see it, when someone calls 311, they're looking for help. And when they don't see that help come in a timely way, they get frustrated, they think government doesn't work, right? I, I mean, if, if, I, if I call the pothole in front of my house, doesn't get filled... In a, in a meaningful amount of time, that I'm thinking, why did I bother to call 311? I, I, I certainly understand your concern, Council Member. Okay. And as far as noise complaints, how are we doing uh, when you know, if someone calls, there's a loud party or there's a restaurant or something that is uh, a, not working the right way when it comes to noise? There's a myriad of things I could name, but how soon do we get someone out there? Um. Largely, our response time has been decreasing as noise complaints in the city have increased, let's say, if you're looking back over a seven-year period. Mm -hmm. um, it's average now of 5.6 days to respond. Oftentimes, that uh, time period reflects the time in which we have to uh, identify the complainant, contact the complainant, and perhaps make an appointment with the complainant to visit their premise and to take noise measurements from within a residential um, structure so or an apartment. And what standard are we using? Are we using the un unreasonable noise standard? Or are we using sort of the objective sort of with the device's measurement of noise? 
Well, that, that's a variety of approaches that we use that are spelled out and expressed in the noise code, and that all depends on what section of the noise code you're referring to. So we are using a combination of unreasonable noise and absolute measurements and associated with absolute thresholds. There's a combination of techniques that we are using within our noise code. All right, so at this time, I'll, I'll turn it over to, I might come back, but I'm going to turn it over to the two sponsors of the bill. So I'll begin with Councilmember Grodnick and then Councilmember Kalis. Thank you. One of the things that I've learned over the past 12 years is that when the administration comes in and says that they support your bill, you should say thank you and move on. So that is what I will do. I have no questions. We appreciate your support. Well said. <laughs> I, 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 I hope to get where uh, Dan is when I get to uh, year 12, except I don't think I will ever get there because of term limits. So, uh, so I, I try to cheat the hearings as an opportunity for folks watching at home or online. Hi to everybody. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos. Uh, and uh, use this as a chance to just learn for folks who haven't had a chance to uh, learn from the agencies themselves. So when DEP responds to a 3 one noise complaint on a construction site, can you issue a violation if there is no after-hours permit but they're doing after-hours work? Yes. Okay. So if DEP responds to a 3 one noise complaint on a construction site, let's say it's the loudest sound you can imagine, it's uh, multiple gunshots at 200 decibels, like that's really loud, uh, and so that's how loud it is. Can you issue a violation if they have an after hours uh, variance and the work that they're doing on the site is within scope? No. Okay, so, so, so to be clear, the, the issue in the law right now is just, that you can't issue noise-related violations no matter how loud it is once they have the after hours. If, if there is a noise mitigation plan on site, yeah. then they have to be in compliance with that noise mitigation plan for their after hour variance activities. So it's not as though they can just at that point, because they have the AHV, um, up their game, if you will, or just exceed whatever uh, threshold they want. So at that point, they are still beholden to the noise mitigation plan. Okay. Uh, but the noise mitigation plan is silent as to decibel levels. It, the uh, enforcement that we're required to do would mean that we need to find a street level uh, exceedance during normal construction hours or we would have to be, if it's after hours, in a complainant's apartment. So that's the way it's currently set up now. It's a sort of a bifurcated uh, approach. Either they're working during normal hours, Monday through Friday, and we would take the street level measurement. We have a threshold for that. Or if they're working after hours, um, we would have to be in a complainant's apartment and there would have to be a um, noise threshold that is exceeded at that level. And so gaining access to a complainant's apartment after hours is one of your challenges, which is I, I, I will, just for our committee council, I will accept their recommendation for a B version to include that uh, they should be able to uh, take the measurement after hours. Uh, and so quick question. Uh, because I think this, this came up in some of the, the media coverage. How many noise inspectors does DEP currently have to deal with hundreds of thousands of complaints? We have currently 57 inspectors and we have an additional five approved for FY17. Okay, so there's five jobs for everyone watching. If anyone wants to do it, where can they apply? <laughs> they can apply to, to New York City DEP. But, and these are, just to be clear, these are uh, inspectors for both air and noise enforcement. Great. And so a question for DOB is how many after, variance, after hours variances did DOB grant this last Saturday? How many of those were out there in the city as we s tried to relax this weekend? So I can't tell you how many after hour variances were issued last weekend, but I'm happy to provide you with um, statistics from, say, last year. Good enough. 2016, um, the department issued a total of 61,199 after-hour variances. That includes just over 18,000 initial variances 
and just about 43,000 renewals. One thing that we've noticed over time, if you go back to the year 2011 up until 2016, the number of initial after-hour variances that we've issued has reduced over time, whereas the number of renewals have increased over time. So this is telling us that the number of sites, locations, jobs that are getting these after-hour variances has reduced from about 25,000 in 2011 to, again, 18,000 um, this past year, 2016 but the number of renewals have increased. So that's where the increase is coming from. So as a department, we've seen about a doubling of the number of after-hour variances that have been issued by the department. Um, but I think when we think about that and look at those numbers, I think we need to bear in mind that we've also seen about a tripling in the amount of new construction throughout the city during those years as well. So 61,900 divided by about 365 comes out to like, so 169 after hours permits at any given time? You, uh, if that's what the math tells us, yes. And, and I think what we're seeing over time is that these sites are receiving renewals over a longer period of time. So fewer sites are getting the variances. Those that are getting them are renewing them over a longer period of time. And that's largely because these jobs are generally much more complex and much more difficult to, to, uh, to perform. So it requires the renewal of these variances. I have a different line of questions, but I'm going to follow this. So if you can follow, if you can help me with this, what has changed in construction between before where you're granting more AHVs to more sites but less frequently to now where there's so much more public safety risk that you're granting these public safety AHV variances more often to more sites? What, what has changed that has made our construction sites so much more different because I, I know that most of the, so, so you can get an AHV for minimal noise impacts, but if that happens, there's no 3 in 1 complaints. So you've stopped granting those in my district, and thank you for not doing that most of the time. Um, the other one is hardship. I don't think anyone's ever. Are fo how many do you, are you still getting the hardship applications? The overwhelming majority is for public safety. I think that's so. Right. So what is what is the public safety issue at the uh, <laughs> so just to, to clarify something, the buildings department is not issuing more variances for more locations. We're issuing more variances for fewer locations, and those variances are being renewed in large measure because the scope of the work is increasing, and that more, larger, more complex jobs are being built over time, which is leading to their request for additional variances. Now, specific to the last point of your question about the public safety reason for which probably something close to 80% of the variances that we issue are under the guise of public safety, that's because doing the work off hours presents less of a public safety risk, particularly as it relates to vehicular and pedestrian traffic. So the types of after-hour variances that we issue under the reason for public safety, it could include things like jumping of a crane, of a hoist, carrying large mechanical equipment onto a hoist, um, many of which deal with the carting of debris, having trucks coming in and out of the site routinely, either carrying de debris or large heavy equipment. Um, these are the kinds of reasons for which we would issue the after-hour variance. So in, in terms of public safety, <clears throat> if the work needs to happen after hours, for public safety reasons, it stands to reason that that same work shouldn't be happening during normal hours. As a general matter, that's correct. And when, we, when applicants filed the after-hour variance with them, one of the questions they're asked, they're, they're, they have to certify that the work being performed after hours, not just the type of work, but also the scale of that work, is not happening during normal business hours, because you're correct. The work happening after hours should not, in terms of the type of work and also the scale of that work, should not be happening during normal business hours as well. So if I can prove to you that the construction sites in my district are doing the, that the trucks are carting away debris on a Friday at 5 o'clock and then they're carting away debris at Friday at 7 o'clock and they're doing the same work, whether it's after hours or during hours, you won't keep granting those after hours variances? And if the work, in terms of not just the type of work, but the scale of the work is identical, they should not be receiving the after hour variance. If you want to bring specific examples to my attention, I'm, we're happy to give it a look. You know I will. Uh, along the same lines, y you're making, y y uh, I guess, a question to whoever w wants to answer it. Uh, 
have you found, have you had occasion to observe that there are uh, different concentrations of people and pedestrian traffic and commercial, heavily in, in areas zoned commercial versus areas zoned for residential? Uh, speaking for DOB, that's not something we've taken a look at to make that kind of, to distinguish between, you know, one, one zoning area and another, but it's something I think we can take a look at for you if you'd like. Uh, w would you consider, and I'm not sure if we could if, add this, but like if they're saying public safety, we should ask them to do pedestrian <laughs> uh, counts because I, I can tell you right now, you can walk around my district right now and, and you will not find residents in my district because it's a residential neighborhood. But if you're doing, but if you show up after five o'clock in my district, uh, you, you will see thousands and thousands and thousands of people on the street, going grocery shopping, uh, in, picking up their kids, taking their kids out, walking their dogs, uh, and uh, I. I I assume this is something that you've seen before in residential neighborhoods, that they're actually busier uh, after 5 o'clock than between the hours of 9 and 5. Have you made that uh, observation? We have made that observation. Uh, I understand your point and where you're going. I mean, the only thing I'd add is that certainly the buildings department, you know, we're not traffic engineers and we don't have the expertise to sort of take a look at what it is you're suggesting, but I understand your concern. If somebody is making an argument that something is a public safety concern, do you think that since they can employ traffic engineers that they should be able to demonstrate that it is safer to do the work after hours in a residential neighborhood than during the day when no one's actually there? As a general matter now, it's certainly something we take a look at. Um, but in terms of traffic analysis, there's no requirement that the applicant provide us with something in the level of detail that you're suggesting. Sure, and just to uh, follow, uh, ju just to go back to DEP, so under the current language of the bill, if somebody called about 311, uh, if we amend it to say that you can take the noise, you can do the measurement from a public right of way, uh, would you be able to go to the site and say, you're over your noise limit, you're not following the mitigation plan, and then make on-site changes to reduce the volume and improve quality of life for folks in the immediate vicinity? Yeah, I, that would certainly be the idea. I think the very first step would be you look at the noise mitigation plan, you see whether or not they have um, reasonably address that issue. If, if the issue has not been addressed, you ask for the change in the noise mitigation plan. So we're always, I guess what I'm trying to emphasize is we aim to seek compliance. We don't aim to enforce um, as a first, uh, you know, exchange through a summons or a violation. I mean, our goal is always to seek compliance as quickly as possible. Okay. And so back to DOB and just following along with the question. So with 61,900 uh, AHVs in, 26, in FY 2016, uh, so our, our brothers and sisters at DEP have 60, soon to be 60, 62 inspectors. How many inspectors does DOB have available on a Saturday to respond to after hours related noise complaints and DEP findings that uh, there is noise at a construction site? Uh, the department has an emergency response unit that's largely responsible for um, addressing these types of complaints. I don't have the exact number of uh, staff within the unit. Um, I want to say it's around a dozen, perhaps a little more, but I'm happy to, to get a firm number and share it with the committee. Both, to, to both agencies, do you believe that you have the current staffing that you need in order to respond to these items in a, in a timely manner? I want to be audible. Yes, we do. I mean, we were very fortunate to be granted the five additional staff members for FY17. We look forward to bringing them on board as quickly as possible, and we feel like we're uh, fully staffed at this point. I, 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 for one, will be advocating with our environmental committee chair for, for perhaps doubling that staff, if, if you will. And I, I hear consensus from my uh, colleague representing uh, Far Rockaway. Uh, and uh, to, to DOB, uh, is a dozen people enough to uh, respond to 61,900? That, that's uh, 
seven, roughly 6,190 per person. Again, we respond based on complaints. So the number I think you should look at is not how many variances are issued, but how many complaints are there associated with the Last year it was 63,000. No, no, that's not correct. As, of, as it relates to after hour variances, we receive close to 4,000 complaints every year. You know, not every construction noise complaint is a building construction noise complaint. There's ton of, tons of construction that happens on roadways on the city street that is not under the department's jurisdiction. So in terms of the complaints we do receive related to after hour variances and work performed outside the hours or outside the scope, we have a staff of inspectors who perform those inspections. Our service level right now is about 17 days. While not ideal, um, it's certainly a far cry better than it was just a couple of years ago. But with the resources that are allotted to the department, that's the service level we're at right now. How, many more, how, how much more would we need to allot to your department in order for you to respond to complaints within 24 hours or even two hours? Certainly it would require a significant increase in resources, an exact number I, I couldn't. So I, I want to just wrap up my first round with a final question to DEP for first round. So. Um, if constituents, a community board, or a council member has ongoing complaints with regards to uh, an establishment that uh, plays music or engages or, set, or uh, a commercial establishment that uh, serves alcohol or plays music after hours, uh, after 9 o'clock, uh, what types of tools does DEP have at disposal and what types of multi-agency responses can uh, community boards, council members, and community members ask for. I'm going to call Jerry Kelpin to come up and give you a very good sense of how we coordinate with the other departments to create the most effective response possible. I do. So, so for um, <clears throat> music uh, complaints, um, there's a process where initially the um, complaint goes to the police department um, <clears throat> for loud music from a commercial establishment. Um, <clears throat> after, um, and on the basis that they can respond um, more quickly than we can. Our, the tools that we have are actually to um, be able to take a reading from a person's apartment um, based on decibel levels, or we could take it from the uh, street, um, and that's basically an unreasonable noise standard that we use, um, the, the same one that was quoted earlier. Uh, <clears throat> Our um, ability to respond to those complaints is usually, you know, the, the next week. Um, most commercial establishments that play music play it every week, or they play it Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, which are generally the loudest uh, nights for the music. Um, and so we set that up with the complainant, and we ask them whether they want us to come to the apartment or whether they just want us to try it from the street. Um, based on their response, we, we set it up and um, do an individual um, inspection of that property. We also have um, another avenue that uh, can be used. Uh, we participate in what's called a multi-agency response to community hotspot complaints. The last C is not there. It's called, we abbreviate it as a MARCH initiative. Um, those locations are generally um, developed, the list that we will inspect from the precinct. They get complaints from their constituents, and um, we, in, we do these marches on, on Friday and Saturday nights usually. Uh, Friday nights are usually two, in, uh, two precincts, Saturday night might be just one. It depends on, on what um, the police department um, wants to set up with us. Uh, it includes building department inspectors, health department, uh, SLA, DEP, um, PD, and probably somebody else that I'm missing, sorry. But, uh, those are the two uh, avenues that we use for uh, responding to those types of complaints. Will you, will you take a march with me down 2nd Avenue in my district? 
If your precinct uh, wants to, uh, absolutely. Um, there are, I, I'm not sure if you're also just talking about uh, nighttime. Um, we also have commercial places that use speakers or are broadcasting during the day. Um, that's kind of like one of our favorites to do as well, but we do have to get the information for us to, to generate that type of response. Thank you, that's the end of my first round. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Richards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the bill sponsors. Uh, can you just speak to how do uh, all of your agencies coordinate? So DEP, NYPD, DOB, do you guys often meet to discuss this issue, being that it is uh, become so problematic? So if there's some sort of task force, how do you communicate? How's interagency communication when it comes to noise? Right. Well, I, I won't Patrick, repeat. Patrick, don't get shy. I won't repeat what uh, Jerry just said in terms of the established initiatives that we have to do a multi-agency response. With respect those, to those, those things exist now. That exists now. Um, with respect to this coordination on AHVs and buildings, um, we have met with the buildings department several times over the last four years. Um, several times. Uh, we have met commissioner to commissioner. I've been involved in, in including myself and the first deputy commissioner. We have had multiple uh, staff meetings where buildings was kind enough to bring at least 12 to 15 people that are currently working on their so new this is not an ongoing building. monthly type thing? It's not though. an ongoing monthly, okay. no. It, ha it has been. Do you been think that would be helpful and sort of addressing this issue? Well, I think the most helpful um, practice that we have currently is we have a designated staff person um, at DEP and a designated staff person at the buildings department that are coordinating on the most um, complicated or difficult cases that we have. So that seems so to be- So one staff member at DOP. Yes, we, uh, one contact within each department to communicate on these tough cases has been a really effective Do practice. Do you think that's a sufficient amount of people People to actually deal with this issue so if I can just add it's it's not limited to one person it's it's one point of contact within each agency as it should be and once that connection is made we sort of prioritize the handling of that complaint and that in our end could involve inspectors it can involve plan examiners I think the relationship that we've only recently started I think is really helpful and that when something particularly comes to DEP's attention, they alert us right away and we prioritize that. But you don't I think that's a big undertaking for two staff members? So there's no unit definitively dedicated to this issue? So speaking for the buildings Sounds department. Sounds like it should be a unit, not necessarily It, it kind two of people. is handled by a unit, depending on where- A unit the, is more than one person. Correct, so correct. depending okay. on where the um, complaint is, mm -hmm. it'll get assigned to the appropriate people who handle complaints in that area. But it all starts with one person who receives the information from DEP, and at that point it gets so shared that one person fields how many complaints? I'm interested in knowing how much, how many complaints that person receives. Uh, I, I don't have an exact number. But um, how many complaints were there in New York City? So in this terms was... of complaints received through 311 for after hour variances work, outside of scope, outside of hours, it's pretty consistent. Each year there's a little under 4,000 complaints that the yeah. building's department Alrighty. receives. All right, so 4,000, a little under 4,000. How much is that individual's case, what does that person's caseload look like? So it, as it relates to those 4,000 or so complaints, uh -huh. it gets routed to our emergency response unit and inspectors within that, those units perform, perform inspections. And, and that's the 61 people that's not gonna? That's at DEP. We have a prox, I think it's a dozen, maybe a couple dozen inspectors, inspectors in ERT who, who perform these inspector, inspectors. So every year we have this discussion. I'm happy you're adding five more again this year, but it, it, to me it does not show that we are serious about addressing noise pollution in New York City. 61 people in this city with as much construction as going on, and then they're not, uh, dedicated specifically just for noise. They do air and they do other things. So I, I find it insignificant to a great degree. I mean, let me not say that. We appreciate the 61, but if we're saying we want to really address this issue, 61 is not enough. Do you agree? Well, not exactly, but just to be clear. Do you during, think 61 people can handle during, during the volume this, of 4,000 complaints? During this administration. Eric, you, you could divide, right? So 61 into 4,000. Ha, 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 ha.
And, and I find it hard to believe. 65. And, and I find it hard to believe that Eric and I represent the end of the earth. And I find it hard to believe that DOB is getting inspectors out in 17 days because we could really get a response in a month when we have complaints with DOB. Our, I'm just saying. I think it depends on the type no of No offense to DOB. Right? So but there's priority B complaints are inspected within, sev within 17 days. Currently, priority A complaints are there within hours. That's your 17 days, you're saying? That's the buildings department performing the ins inspections, yes. So you sure your people get out within 17 days? That's our service level for B complaints, absolutely. And that's across the board in DOP, is that? All, pro all category B complaints receive an inspection no later than 17 days. All right. And how do you address hot spots? I well, just for the record, I, I want to just go back for one moment. Um, during this de Blasio administration, we have first added seven additional um, I'm noise. I'm to chair the committee. Air and Costa was helpful with that, but mm -hmm. that's still not yes, enough. Yes, and, and we're grateful mm -hmm. for your support for that and your acknowledgement and recognition. I have a tremendous amount of respect for what these uh, inspectors can accomplish, and it's a really wonderful entry level um, job market as well because we bring people on. Um, most of the uh, First level air noise inspectors or high school degree. Um, we end up recruiting a really tremendous and very talented pool. I get that. So what I'm this saying is, is, this is really we need more than 61 more talented people. 62. 62. With the, I'm sorry. With the five that we added for 17. There. And can you just go into how we address hot spots and how you know how do the agencies coordinate? When you know right. About so hotspots. when when the inspectors um, and what, this is with the communication that we've been having really um, very fluidly over the last several years, when they are seeing repeat offenders or when they are seeing complaints that are um, consistently occurring at certain addresses, they're bubbling it up to their management and then we are discussing as senior management and those are the cases that we are then bringing to the attention of the buildings department. And what is the penalty? Repeat offenders? So um, as it relates to performing work uh, contrary to the variance or not having a variance, the penalties start at $1,600 and could, depending on a number of conditions, including repeat offenders, could go as high as $25,000. Additionally, if there's um, re repeat occurrences, obviously work would be stopped on the jo job. And how many of these summonses were given out last year? Uh, we issued... That's, I'm concluding my question. There, so calendar year 2016, there were 3,823 complaints. 3,800 complaints? Yeah, for work outside of the variance. Summonses? Uh, uh, those are complaints. Those are complaints. Number of violations we issued totaled 121. So 121 out of 3,800. Correct. Hmm. Oftentimes when we perform inspection, we learn that there already is a variance in place. So it's, it was issued appropriately. There's no the reason for a violation. 121 out of 3,800. And do you think that has to do with you getting out there in 17 days? Perhaps in part. But again, many of the times when we perform our inspections, a violation is not issued, not because of how long it took for us to get there. It's because there already was a variance in place or the work is actually happening during normal business hours. And also what I was alluding to earlier, these variances more, more frequently are being issued for sustained periods of time. So even if we got out there in 17 days, for many of these jobs, they still have the variance. So it's not like the work is, in most instances, it's not like the work is concluded, we're showing up, and the violation wasn't issued because the work's over. They don't have the variance anymore. That's generally not the case. They have variances for a long period of time, and when these violations are not issued, it's because they have a variance that was issued appropriately, or they're doing work at 7.30 in the morning, which is not outside of normal construction hours. I'm going to assume the truth is in the middle here, and um, I just don't think we have enough inspectors, and you getting out there in 17 days, the issue is probably rectified, or people have given up calling 311 probably after that. So, I, you know, I think I've been beating a dead horse for the past few years. Uh, if we're serious, we'll have more inspectors, or we'll just keep adding five more every year. Maybe we'll get to 100 one day, 200, and we'll continue to be the city that doesn't sleep in many ways. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Richards. Uh, Councilmember Elledge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, let's see. First, I, well, I have two sets of questions. I'll try to be brief. I know that the sponsors of the bills uh, want to speak again. Uh, first of all, thank you for your testimony. Uh, a couple of years back, I, I, my office used to work with a gentleman who was heading up the noise complaint uh, division. I think it was Joe Singleton or what? Joe? Uh, Joe Scafidi. Scafidi. I'm sorry. Yes. Joe, Joe Scafidi. Scafidi. He was very, very helpful. And I know he's, he's uh, retired, I think, from... Still with us. Oh, he's still with still. you. Well, he was... Well, then I just retired him early, I guess. But uh, he was very helpful in my office. Uh, working with my office, I should say, and the local precinct to identify the chronic noise complaints in uh, the 102 precinct and the 106 precinct in particular, and I think they took the, uh, the, the worst offenders that they received via the 311 complaints and also the precinct council, and then they went on a Saturday or Friday night. Uh, this was about four or five years ago, I think, and they would respond to those uh, chronic Noise offenders, and lo and behold, like six out of ten were, were doing it again. So they were issue, able to issue substantial uh, fines and fees and, and help uh, get a handle on uh, those particular locations. And they weren't always commercial. Sometimes they were residential. They were people that were just having these wild parties every weekend. Anyway, so uh, I'm glad he's not retired. I'm sure he's doing good work in the agency uh, someplace else. But, um, you know, w we do receive still a good number of complaints one of the areas that I'm curious about is how the city sort of polices itself. In my district, we have uh, several, well, a few uh, very large-scale capital projects that are being supervised by DDC and or DOT. Uh, one in particular is the Albert Road Reconstruction Project, HQ411B. Uh, that was going on simultaneously with the School Construction Authority. We just built a, a beautiful public school that just opened on Albert Road, coincidentally, uh, I think it's PS 377. So you had a br school construction and street sewer sidewalks major infrastructure project going on simultaneously. My office, 311, absolutely flooded with construction related complaints uh, and noise complaints that were emanating from, you know, trucks, machinery, cranes, workers, you name it. I think one of the great challenges that we had was that because it was a quote-unquote city project that there was an enormous amount of leniency given to the contractors that were hired by SCA or DDC to perform this work. And I'm just wondering how the city goes about enforcing quality of life and noise uh, controls when the city is actually the one supervising or governing the project, if you will. So can you, can you walk me through that or, or speak to that particular concern? Right. So we, we are definitely appreciate those concerns, um, and those do create some challenging circumstances when we don't rely on the enforcement through violations and we have to rely on cooperation um, and communication with these other city agencies. Uh, and that is the tool that we go to. Um, we have found the agencies to be cooperative. If they're not cooperative with us at a staff level, we would usually call it out to our commissioner who will contact another commissioner as well. Um, but these do uh, definitely create additional uh, challenges for us when we can't necessarily rely on a violation to the contractor. But so in, in the, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but in those instances when the SCA has hired a contractor to build a school and the contractor is not cooperative with the SCA uh, you know, communicating complaints that me and the other elected officials and the community board has received, DEP and or buildings can't issue violations? Is that, is that correct? Or, or, or do they choose not to? Is there a rule that says that they cannot? I mean, it's still a private contract that they still have to follow the rules. What is the process there? Well, you know, and speaking as an agency who does a lot of capital work, we certainly appreciate that, but we rely on the city agency that o oversees the contractor to bring about um, compliance and cooperation um, that is certainly, I think, expressed in the noise code as well. 
So, I mean, th this is very interesting for the committee to consider, is that the city doesn't necessarily always hold itself accountable because we go out and hire these private contractors to do public works projects, but then they're not following the same rules that private developers and other people are having to follow. And we're not able to, you know, we only use the carrot necessarily. We're not able to use or we're not willing to use the stick. And I find that that's been the case forever. I mean, I'm not blaming the administration or the commissioners that happen to run the agencies now. It seems that when SCA is building a school or DDC and DOT or, or, DOT or, or you know, the, the library system is working with DDC to renovate a library, build a library, and they're making a lot of noise or they're, you know, they're going past the legal time that they're allowed to do the work or they're not being considerate of the community that, you know, how many violations are we issuing to those contractors? I don't know if we have data on that or if we even know what the answer is. I, I, I don't, know. don't have data on that, um, certainly not with me here. But yeah. I, I, would put the, I would define the problem a little bit differently. I think they are held to the same um, level of accountability. Um, what we don't have is, again, and I'm emphasizing because we don't have the ability to uh, issue the violations or summons and have that violation upheld at, an, at the ECB. Now, so what, why? But we are still relying on the noise mitigation plans and the compliance with those noise mitigation plans and best um, techniques or best available strategies for bringing about noise mitigation. I don't know, Jerry, you want to add anything to that with your experience? Please, ma'am. If you don't mind. Um, one of the reasons that this bill is being put forward is that um, the current structure of the noise code for construction um, laid out um, a mechanism where uh, we worked with the contractors to do mitigation sort of up front, and we gave it a lot of latitude with going back and forth and revising the, the um, plans and things like that, and that there's actually very few sections that are hardcore um, language to allowing us to issue. And, and one of the things that um, the code says is that if you have a noise mitigation plan and you're complying with it, and if we ask you to do more, you do, um, we can't, there's no mechanism for us to issue the violation. If, and, and that's what some of this language that you're proposing will give us an opportunity to now go in and say, yes, you do have a plan, it's doing a, a lot of things, but we still have issues and we need you to reduce your noise by doing a number of different things. And if you don't, then a violation will be issued. Um, so, so that's the basic thing. Um, the city construction sites, often they're more difficult, but we, if they, if they don't have authorization from uh, DDC or, or DOT that it's not written into their contract, we, we have issued to the contractor for not complying. We also, if we run into a problem, we do go back to the agency who's coordinating the program to say we're having real issues. We need you to take a harder look. Um, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect system. It doesn't work all of the time. but. Those are sort of the, the constraints that we're facing with both city projects and the general you know, construction industry. So I hope that sort of helps yes. to put it in perspective. That, that's very interesting. Thank you, uh, Jerry, as always. Uh, let me transition very quickly to the second part of my questions regarding Resolution 1177. Uh, related to noise complaints. Now, you probably know that I represent a district that's adjacent to Jamaica Bay and uh, John F. Kennedy Airport, uh, as does uh, Councilmember Richards. We receive many, many noise-related complaints uh, that are coming from the fact that there are planes literally landing over people's houses, right, and in, in the direct flight paths of, uh, of uh, what the FAA has allowed these airlines to use. The city, I think, has taken uh, sort of a backseat approach to saying, well, this is a federal issue. This is the FAA. They determine the flight patterns. We really can't enforce any noise codes when it comes to uh, noise that comes from planes, and you should take this up with the FAA and the Port Authority in particular. And we have for a good number of years. And I think that most of those complaints have fallen on deaf ears. And I know that this is a capital of the world. There are, you know, 
tens of thousands of people and cargo coming in every day. I don't want to interrupt international commerce or travel or inconvenience a lot of that in any way. Uh, but it's really not fair to a lot of people that live in communities close to the airports that they have to suffer through this, you know, just night after night and day after day, and that their city government is not being proactive in any way. And so I guess my question is a very broad one. How do you engage FAA, or when do you engage the FAA or the Port Authority on noise mitigation that comes from airplane noise and the communities adjacent to? Can, can you be specific about meetings that you have or conversations or ways that the city is working together with our federal partners, but how are we as a city mitigating airplane noise in places in Queens and, and places close to the airport? We, we certainly understand that this is really um, a quality of life issue and, and potentially even a health issue associated with um, the flight paths and the intensity on the, some of those flight paths. Uh, we do lend expertise. We try uh, to have and encourage the FAA to um, have and listen to some of the expertise that our staff brings to their task force. We have helped them develop the um, LDN reports that they did, their, their day-night noise equivalency for those airplanes. Um, that said, I suppose a coordination um, you know, could, could improve. Um, I'm not sure that they are necessarily driven by the same concerns that we are with respect to uh, protecting the health and well-being of the, of the citizens here. So I'm, I, I know and I can appreciate that you've certainly seen like you've reached out as well and you know that it's a very difficult uh, situation to balance. Have there, any, have there been any conversations uh, that the administration or the commissioners have had with uh, some of the federal legislatures, Senator Su Schumer or Congresswoman Meng or Crowley or anybody regarding potential legislation that the city could support? Or, I mean, this resolution speaks to one in particular, but, um, you know, are there any changes or anything that, that the city can do proactively to engage the federal government on the issue of, of of noise complaints that come from from airplanes. I mean, they, they, they are significant and substantial enough that I think that it warrants our, our attention or at least our, our focus in some way. I mean, we, we really are supportive of the uh, studies and the concerns, and I think bringing that information to the decision makers is an important step. Um, but we are quite cognizant of the limitations on our authority when it comes to those federal um, reg regulations. Okay. Let me uh, propose, lastly, uh, an idea that I had. Sanitation, several years ago, Department of Sanitation came out with a uh, affidavit complaint program that, you know, residents who live nearby a cemetery or, or an old factory, that at nighttime where there was all this illegal dumping taking place, that someone could you know, take photographs or video and actually sign a sworn affidavit that the department provides a form for online, they get it notarized, they send it in, and that would result in the issuance of some form of violation, right? Okay, yeah, we, we have the bill, right? Okay, so did, is there a bill that would allow DEP, th that residents could make the same, you know, obviously your inspectors can't be at somebody's house at 3 o'clock in the morning every Wednesday night when this one particular, you know, serious chronic noise condition happens, right? But if someone was able to substantiate, you know, with empirical evidence, you know, they had a, a sound measuring app on their phone or video or a sworn affidavit that they're willing to go to ECB court and say, this really took place, here is the proof, how come DEP is not able to do what, what sanitation is already allowing regular citizens to do, which is to help you enforce the noise code and, and maintain a good quality of life? Uh, can, can we do that? Can we start a pilot program? Would, you know, I, uh, Donovan Richards just mentioned there's a bill. I didn't even know there was a bill, but maybe that's something that you want to take up independently. Um, this, is, this sounds like a really good idea. And it's not to say that you're going to get flooded. By the way, if somebody lies on a sworn affidavit, it's tossed out, and that person could be 
charged with full, filing a false instrument. So it's not as if you're going to get all these people that anonymously just want to get back at their neighbors. If people can substantiate real and chronic noise conditions that affect their quality of life and sign a sworn notarized affidavit, and, we're, and the city is already allowing people to do this with illegal dumping through sanitation, why can't we do it with noise complaints and DEP? We find that a very interesting idea. I would very much like to go back and take a hard look at this and really study what it is that sanitation is doing. Um, and we'll explore that idea more fully and, and, and get back to you. It's, it's just a recommendation. I want to thank you for your testimony. And I have to say that DEP, especially uh, Mario Bruno and uh, several others from your office, have been very, very helpful to my constituents. Uh, especially since Hurricane Sandy. Emily Lloyd was, a, uh, was and is a phenomenal uh, person and public servant. Uh, I was a big fan of hers. Uh, I know that she's no longer there, uh, but uh, Vincent Sapienza, I think, is doing also an excellent, excellent job running the agency. I have nothing but compliments. Uh, we just look forward to working more closely together on some of these quality of life complaints and issues. But thank you very much again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I agree with you on this whole idea of an affidavit. It sounds like a very interesting idea. I think there's legislation. So we'll take a look at it. Um, I have a few more questions. I'll turn it back over to Councilmember Richards as well. Um, just going back to noise meters. How many noise meters do we have total at DEP's disposal? Do you know how many, Jerry, off the top of your head? How many noise meters we have? At least 57. At least. At, six, at least 62. Yeah, 60. We, we, we believe we have more than 60, but if we'd have to get a specific number for you. This, I will to say, suggest, though, to you that this is not an issue. We have enough meters to do the, the tasks that we have. So we have enough meters. Yes, so that has not been so an when issue. So when someone, someone goes out for a noise complaint, is it standard practice to take the meter with them? They normally would have a meter with them, especially under the circumstances where they know the section of the code requires an absolute measurement. If, let's say, a team is going to look at a noise mitigation plan, they may not have a meter in the car at, for, for their use at that time. But there, this issue with respect to the instruments not being available is truly a falsehood. We, okay. we have plenty of meters. We have and plenty not of only meters. Not only do we have them available, but they're very well calibrated, and that is a very, you know, tricky business. They have to be constantly tuned and well calibrated, and that has never been an issue that has held us back. Okay, and as far as when someone take, goes out with them, everyone is, every one of the 62 inspectors, right? They're all trained. Soon to be 62. Soon to be 62, <laughs> so 61 and a third. Then we'll, 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 uh, whoever that, that person becomes, they're, they're well trained on knowing how to use the meter. That's, it's not a challenge for them. No. No, they're, they're, they're well trained um, in the meters. The meters are actually fairly easy to use. Again, uh, we suggest that the trickier part is to make sure that they are well calibrated. Mm -hmm. um, but I myself have been out there in the field with the inspectors, and their work is extremely impressive. I, you know, I don't doubt that. I, I just know I continue to get complaints from both sides, mm -hmm. right, from those that are making the complaints and those that are having the complaints levied against them, that the unreasonable noise standard is a challenge, right? That. Um, my unreasonable noise in my mind may be your music to your ears. And to continue to allow that to be somehow in our code is a complication for everyone involved. There should be an objective standard that we use. And so when somebody are responding to a complaint, that meter should be used at all times, right? Well, we need to use it, especially when the code requires that the absolute measurement be the threshold um, to decide upon whether or not they're in compliance or not. Sometimes some discretion is helpful um, to our unit, um, and they are, you know, well-trained and well-tuned to be dealing with some of these issues. Um, sometimes a narrative standard can be helpful, uh, but I would tend to agree that uh, with respect to absolute standards, it certainly makes it easier for us to um, justify and to document the issues at hand. And one of the barriers to us adding that, that reading, um, the noise meter readings to our, our inspection reports? 
For the most, for the most part, um, most of the reports that I see, they usually are taking a measurement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these these measurements can be complicated mm -hmm. by the fact that you have background noise conditions, and what you would need to do in order to discern a specific um, noise emanating from a source is you would need to turn that source off, mm -hmm. take a background measurement, then turn that source back on. So these can be time consuming efforts and it, it, it can, it does require a lot of cooperation on the part of that um, noise maker. Okay, and that last question I have relating to airplane noise, I know it's, uh, it's complicated, but how often do you meet with FAA or how often? Well, as I said earlier, we have a staff person who sits on their task force. Having said that, I am not sh certain how often that task force meets. Um, so we, I myself have not met with the FAA, and uh, we certainly will but, look so into that So it's not for issue. lack of trying on our part. It's really them just tuning us out is what, you know, is what you're saying. I mean, we, we try to make recommendations to them. We, again, try to provide experience that we have in the city. Um, we try to uh, highlight the sensitivities that we have, that we hear from our constituency as well. But be that as it may, the city does, uh, has certain restrictions on its authority when it comes to the uh, federal authorities. I know for me, I mean, sitting in the, in, in the Jackson Heights portion of my district right by LaGuardia Airport, I could be sitting as close as I am to Samara right now and her not hear a word I'm saying, and I'm, I'm a little bit of a loud guy, and it, it's impossible to hear, and imagine that in your home, so uh, we have to do better, and if, if they won't listen to us, then we'll have to like, find a way to amplify our noise to make sure that, uh, that they hear us down there. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Richards. Thank you, Chairman. And I live in a flight pad, so I certainly know. I live in Rosedale, uh, right outside the airport. Just one quick question. So uh, I know other cities have sued the FAA. Has the city ever given any thought to this? So Covert City, Newport Beach, and would the city ever consider any action like that? I mean, I don't know if you have the answer, <laughs> but, I think that, but let's I think imagine. Is, I think that is something you know. that we really would have to investigate with the Corporation Council and really understand whether or not the city has either authority or those have the law litigation. Well, other cities have done it. So. Have been right. successful. So right. I, I right. myself just I don't have success. the background. I'd have yeah. to look into it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Richards. And with that, uh, I thank you for your testimony. I look forward to working with you on these two pieces of legislation and noise in general. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, if you can uh, come forward and be sworn. Oh, wait. Go ahead. I just want to thank the wonderful staff at DEP. I know I was hard today. DOB, uh, <laughs> DEP, <laughs> Mario and company are great. Patrick and I go back a long time, so love-hate relationship. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you, DOB, too. <laughs> All right, if you can step forward and be sworn, Warren Schreiber, Susan Carroll, Roberto Gautier, and Arlene Bronzaft. Bronzaft. If you can all please step forward, please. No, oh, you're good. And if there's anyone else in the room who wants to testify, you have to fill out one of these slips because there is only one more panel after this one. So speak up or you cannot speak up. Samara, if you can swear the panel in, please. Uh, can you please raise your right hands? Okay. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, ready? Good? Warren, okay. always ready for you, Thank sir. you. Um, I want to thank um, the uh, chairman and uh, members of the Environmental Protection Committee for allowing me to offer testimony in favor of Resolution 1177. On March 24, 2014, Governor Andrew Cuomo directed the Port Authority to establish aviation community roundtables. Governor Cuomo further directed the Port Authority to conduct a federal airport noise compatibility planning part 150 study 
to better evaluate noise impacts to the communities surrounding JFK and LaGuardia airports. I currently serve as co-chair of the New York Community Aviation Roundtable. Elected officials, community boards, governmental agencies, airlines, airport industry groups, business organizations, and community stakeholders are roundtable members. NICAR, uh, which uh, we now call ourselves, represents more than four million residents of New York City and Nassau County who are negatively affected by operations at JFK and LaGuardia Airport. I'm also a member of the LaGuardia Airport Part 150 Technical Advisory Committee. Governor Cuomo's directive stated the Part 150 study helps to identify residences, schools, libraries, hospitals, nursing homes, and places of worship adversely impacted by aircraft noise. Mitig mitigation efforts taken at other airports that have done Part 150 studies include revamping of flight ramps and approach procedures, encouraging airlines to use quieter aircraft and installing soundproofing to eligible properties. Noise is defined as unwanted or objectionable sound. The FAA has formally adopted DNL as its primary metric to evaluate cumulative noise effects on people due to aviation activities. DNL is the 24 our sound level in decibels as derived from all aircraft operations during a 24-hour period. DNL adds a 10 dB noise penalty to each aircraft operation occurring during nighttime hours, which is 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. The FAA currently uses 65 dBA DNL to determine the onset of substantial impact. The United States Environmental Protection Agency, the World Health Organization, and others have recommended 55 DNL as a more appropriate noise level threshold. Attached to my testimony is Appendix J for both JFK and LaGuardia Airport. Appendix J details the noise contours as identified by the Part 150 noise exposure maps. The study included 55 DNL for information purposes only, but the noise contours estimate the population and area impacted by both 65 and 55 DNL. When 55 DNL is applied to the Part 150 noise exposure maps. The population impacted by aircraft noise increases more than threefold. The New York Community Aviation Roundtable supports Resolution 1177. However, while Resolution 1177 is viewed as an important first step, there is still there is more that still needs to be done. NICAR looks forward to partnering with the City Council in an effort to provide the residents of New York City and Nassau County with quiet skies. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Susan. Thank you to Council Member Costa Consensanitas and the Committee on Environmental Protection for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Susan Carroll, and I'm one of Queensborough President Melinda Katz's representatives on the LaGuardia Airport Committee of the New York Community Aviation Roundtable. However, the opinions expressed here are solely my own. From the day I was born till this past May, I resided in a high-rise apartment building in the downtown section of Flushing, Queens. Given its proximity to LaGuardia Airport, airplanes were always part of the din of this thriving community. Over the past five years, though, due to the introduction of more concentrated satellite-based flight paths, along with changes made to how older flight paths are flown, 
and an increase in use of previously rarely used noise-intensive routes, life and flushing became unbearable for me. Takeoffs and landings that formerly flew over Flushing Meadows Corona Park were redirected over downtown Flushing, which has seen an explosion in population growth in recent years. In the summer of 2014, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey installed a portable noise monitor on the roof of my building as part of Governor Andrew Cuomo's directive that year to the port to double the number of noise monitors in neighborhoods around LaGuardia and John F. Kennedy International Airports. According to the readings on this monitor, the noise levels of planes overflying my building routinely exceed 80 decibels. On many days, the roar continues every minute for up to 18 hours at a time. However, due to a determination made by the Federal Aviation Administration in the 1970s, my former residence is not considered to be significantly impacted by LaGuardia operations. Since the disco era, the FAA has used the 65 day-night level, or DNL, threshold to determine whether or not a particular area is significantly impacted by aircraft noise and thus eligible for sound mitigation and noise abatement measures. My former home in Flushing is just outside what is called the 65 DNL contour. Therefore, it will not be included as a candidate for soundproofing at the conclusion of the Port Authority's ongoing Part 150 noise study which adheres to strict federal guidelines and therefore only examines homes, schools, businesses, places of worship, and historic sites within the 65 DNL contour. Why is it that the Environmental Protection Agency, the World Health Organization, and most of the developed world use the 55 DNL threshold while the FAA continues to use 65? The world has advanced greatly since the 1970s. Studies have shown that noise is not simply an annoyance. Exposure to high levels, high levels of noise can have serious health consequences. In 2013, the Harvard School of Public Health published results from a study determining that elderly individuals living near airports under heavily used flight paths have a higher risk of being admitted to the hospital for cardiovascular disease. My former residence in Flushing has a large number of senior citizens, as does much of downtown Flushing all of who are being exposed to noise levels greater than what is recommended by most federal agencies for a healthy life. Currently, there is a debate on whether DNL, which represents an average, is even the best way to measure the true impact of repetitive aircraft noise. The FAA itself is conducting an ongoing multi-year study on noise exposure and annoyance. In the meantime, though, they can, at the very least, join their colleagues in the federal government and reduce the noise threshold to 55 DNL. Doing so would perhaps lead to a change in how the FAA determines a significant impact. It would lead to an increase in properties eligible for soundproofing. Other alternatives that might occur as a result of a reduction to 55 DNL include a speed up in retirement of older, louder aircraft and a more equitable distribution of flight paths, so no single neighborhood bears the brunt of aircraft noise. New York City is a progressive leader. As the landlord of the airports, it has an obligation to protect its residents, including and especially its most vulnerable ones. Yes, the airports are economic engines, but that fact should not override the ability of, neighbor of neighborhoods to be livable. Therefore, the New York City Council needs to take a proactive stance and pass resolution number 1177. It must join the chorus of elected officials across the nation and let Congress and the President know that it is time for the FAA to catch up with the rest of the world and adopt the 55 DNL threshold. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Okay, uh, the last time I was here was uh, the 28th of, of February 2014. I was testifying about the noise in our neighborhood um, uh, from construction on the Brooklyn Bridge uh, that's connected with the Brooklyn Bridge Rehabilitation Project that started in the summer of 2010 and basically just mostly finished up recently. It, there's still a few more things to be done, so it's not quite t totally finished. It's gone over several uh, deadlines, 
But what was happening is that uh, the work was being done starting at 11 p.m. going till 6 a.m. So uh, most people would like to be able to sleep in that period of time. However, echoing the previous testimony of this, the agencies, the agencies of uh, DOB and the DEP, apparently um, people were left out. Uh, people were left out, then not protected by the noise code. Uh, one of the reasons is that there's a uh, provision that a, the protections are not really there if the work is classified under the category of rehabilitation. So if, it, if the Brooklyn Bridge were totally being reconstructed, a new bridge were being put up, then we would be protected. So as a token member of a DOT working group, um, I brought these points up <clears throat> and I sat with engineers and people who were elected officials and DE people, DEP people like uh, Mike Gilsonen and Jerry from the DEP as well as uh, other people in the neighborhood. And we were told, I asked, when you started the project, did you do any studies to look at the impact of peop on people's lives of this work. Uh, and I was told, oh yes, we did tons of studies. These were, and what did you study? Traffic flow. Now traffic flow is very important. It's the economic element to it, just like I, it was rest recommended that the, you know, re mentioned that the airports are part of this economic engine. People are left out there and people were left out where I live. So I live 23 stories above the exit ramp at Cadman Plaza West, and um, we were just massacred. And uh, th there is obviously uh, a need, by the way, going back to the previous te testimony, um, I was shocked that the DEP did not ask for more inspectors. How would 61 inspectors for the entire city of New York, millions of people, be served by those numbers of inspectors? And if, you know, and in terms of the DOB as well, 12 people or two dozen people, it, we are not being protected. Now, I'm not putting all the blame on those agencies because those agencies were left out of the mix. They were not, uh, the DEP seemingly was not able to step up and protect people because it was an interagency fight. So it, it's just, it just, I'm not going to leave the city council out either because in 2014 there, were, the, there was lip service done in terms of the helicopter noise now, many of the council people were feeling the pain of uh, residents of New York whose lives were being impacted badly by helicopters. Nothing was done. It's, it's you know, really, it's, and uh, let me just, you know, give a vote for having the city of New York sue the FAA. This, as, uh, you know, Councilman Donovan mentioned, other cities have sued Arizona and, and other, other uh, you know, pl places have used that method. The de Blasio administration leaves the people out. We're not protected. I just really cannot understand it. And then to go back and say we need more studies? We have had enough studies. Studies, I mean, <laughs> how many people need a study to told, be told that you need to have your health, your, your health is being imp impacted if there's work being done from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. every day? It's, it's ridiculous. Just let me put in another word for looking at another source of noise at the construction sites 
which is one of the ones that really got us, which is the uh, backup alarm or motion alarm on the vehicles. That shouldn't happen. I contacted OSHA and I said, what do you think of the backup alarms? And I was told, we hate them because they can be disconnected if there's a flag or spotter there at the site. But once again, it's money to protect people. The, you know, these co construction companies, Skanska in particular, was involved in our project. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't want to pay. So um, I'm just, uh, I'm not sure if I'm happy <laughs> with what was testified today because it's the, the agencies that are the agency that is supposed to protect us in terms of the environment is the DEP, but they only have a handful of people working, and they are not only working on air and noise complaints; they probably are also working on flooding. So I'm not sure about that, but you know maybe. Uh, but are there? So there are special groups of inspectors for flooding. Okay. Right, can, we, can we keep the questions and answers here at this table? Thank you. Yeah, okay. So at any rate, I'm hoping that uh, you could go beyond lip service, though, and really do something. Because uh, when a, an agency that's obviously not serving the people does not ask for assistance, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Arlene because uh, she, she has done years of research on this. Thank you. Um, Arlene Bronzaft, uh, Professor Emerita of the City University of New York, and uh, board member of Grow NYC, where I have served for five mayors, non-paid volunteer position, in which I chair its noise committee and respond to noise complaints of citizens throughout the city. Now, it's I am a researcher, and in fact, it is my research that's the landmark research on the effects of noise on children's learning. And it was done here in New York City because a student of mine at Lehman College had a child who went to a school that was adjacent to an elevated train track. And what she wanted to know was, could I help her? I teach environmental psych and the effects of noise on people's well-being. She said, can you help the children? They cannot learn in that school. The train comes by every four minutes. That wouldn't have to be PS85, would it be in Astoria, Queens, would it? Pardon? Upper Manhattan. Oh, Upper Manhattan. I did okay. work at PS85 in Queens. I did work with the assemblywoman. Okay. But this study emanated many years ago. And she said, could you help the children? She tried everyone. She tried the city council. She tried her public officials. And what they were going to do was they were going to sue the city of New York. Well, as a researcher, I know you have to prove that you have an adverse impact. I'm also, I also was the wife of an attorney, so I know you have to prove your case. But I did go to the school, and the principal allowed me to look at the reading scores of children adjacent to the trains and those on the quiet side of the building. And I found that by the sixth grade, the children were nearly a year behind in reading. That was a pretty dramatic finding. Not only was that published in an academic journal, and not only has it been cited worldwide, and not only did it serve as one of the studies that the FAA used to quiet schools near airports, the press, the media, the public, shouted out that children were being adversely affected by train noise, and this was the 70s, and you know the Transit Authority wasn't popular then, it's not popular now. But here was the surprising thing. It was the city of New York, DEP, that did the noise measurements for me. And so no one could question about this academic psychologist measuring decimal levels. After the paper was published in an academic journal, I knew I had not helped the children in that school. I just got a brownie point as a professor. 
And so I went to the transit authority, learned they were coming up with a method to quiet the tracks uh, by putting rubber resilient pads on, urged them to choose PS98 to do their study, and then went to the Board of Ed and asked for acoustical ceilings. Now you're going to ask, how did I get these two agencies to say yes to me? Do you believe in miracles? I do. And after they abated the noise, I was asked by the president of the city council, actually, because money was spent to abate the noise, to go back and see if it helped the children. And I did another study, and now with the classes on the side adjacent to the elevated trains and those on the quiet side, the children now were reading at the same level. Now, these studies were done nearly 40 years ago. My daughter was eight years old at the time. She couldn't understand why her mother had to do a study to figure out whether children could learn in a noisy classroom. And now here I am, all these years later, and I still address the issue of noise and its impact on learning. I just served on a committee from the National Academy of Sciences, which was looking to see if aircraft noise affect children's learning. Now let me look at two other studies done in New York City that you should be interested in. They dealt with aircraft noise. One was done on Staten Island, and one was done in Queens. One study in Queens was supported by Congressman Crowley, who needed data to support the fact that noise impacts on people's health. The other was uh, supported by Council, uh, by the Borough President Molinari. Both these studies looked in New York City on the adverse effects of noise on people's well-being. You don't need me to give you the answer. It disrupted their sleep. It diminished their quality of life. They could not use their backyards. They could not watch TV. In other words, noise is harmful to health. So here we are. I have spent 40 years researching, writing, and speaking worldwide. I do not just speak in the United States, and this includes Wyoming, Montana, Texas, Louisiana, but Cromwell, New Zealand, and Canada, and Sweden, and I've been interviewed by the media in every, from every continent except the Antarctica, so I'm assuming it's quiet there. We know that noise is detrimental to health. I thank uh, uh, Ms. Swanston for asking me to speak to it. In fact, I know you also have my book, Why Noise Matters, which I've co-authored with four Brits. Uh, the, the literature is overwhelming. We heard about the Dominici study from Harvard. That was done on several million people. We know the study done by Hansel in the UK on several million people living near airports. I am an academic. I'm going to tell you enough with the research. We have enough data. We need policy. I would urge you to read the latest paper I published in the Journal of Social Science, which is online. I believe I sent it to you. It speaks to the divide between policy and research. The research is overwhelming, but where is the policy? It is ironic to look back and see that we passed the Noise Control Act in 1972 under Richard Nixon. We were fortunate enough to have not only the act, but EPA setting up the Office of Noise Abatement and Control, which was headed by two outstanding people, Mr. Ruckelhaus and Russell Train, whose obituary appeared in the New York Times several years ago because he was so active in trying to get this country to lessen its noise. It is interesting, we're ta talking about the FAA, and I will address FAA, but Russell Train, when he was the administrative of EPA, said to the FAA, look, we know that noise is harmful, we know what to do, Get it done. And I'm going back to the 70s. Now, when my daughter at eight could not understand why her mother was studying this, my daughter now is 50, and she's somewhat embarrassed because she thinks her mother hasn't made enough progress in this area because she's still talking about the same thing. 
Look at the two Part 150 studies. I thank you for urging those studies. But how can you trust an agency when it still defines noise? Please look at the glossary of those two studies. It defines it as an annoyance. It says that loud sounds affect hearing. When an agency still calls something an annoyance, then how are you going to expect that agency to respond affirmatively to your demands? If you look further into that document, and I urge you to read it carefully, it is accompanied by several other documents which says we still need more research to move ahead. Do you know that the federal government actually funded a study in the United States that stipulated that since most of the research on the effects of noise on health are done in Europe, that we in the United States have to do our studies because how do we know that we can generalize from the Europeans to the Americans? Apparently their hearts, their ears, their souls, their feelings are different. I think that study was an absolute embarrassment. I do cite it and refer to it in my writing. So now we're going to look at the FAA. I applaud you. I'm glad that you have suggested that they move to 55 D DBA on the DNL, but you know that the single plane that awakens my 11-year-old grandson in Bayside is not going to be part of an analysis as to whether it impacts. In fact, he should have been testifying today because I think out of the mouth of a child, we might take greater, pay greater attention, just as my studies on children garnered all this support. I'm recommending him for your next hearing rather than myself. When we talk about construction noise, I too was stunned to see that not enough people, or that the commissioner said there were sufficient numbers of people. There are not. But let me tell you what else is wrong with the noise code that was not brought up today. In the noise code, DP lists quieter equipment that could be used, by the way, in terms of a backup beep, the broadband backup beep is quieter. It is only suggested it is not demanded. You want to make a change? Go to the noise code and say, you have to use quieter tools. You have to use cushioning around a site. Not, we suggest that you look at the quieter. I do believe we need more people. I work closely with DEP, and I know they try very hard. But we have to do that. And that's what I would like to see. In terms of the city council, I do think you as individuals can take a more active role. Your voices do count. Russell Train, while he was the head of the EPA, could not dictate to the FAA what the noise level should be. But the pressure he put on the FAA was commendable. He really tried hard, and we had an effective ONAC at that time. Your voices will count. You have to look, and I will work with you on with, and as you move forward. I think the experience I bring is not just my research, my writings, but it's my knowledge of, of the law. I don't have to read about ONAC. I don't have to read about the noise code. I don't have to read about Reagan essentially defunding the office. I lived it. I had a grant before ONAC, which was going to look at the effects of noise on children who lived in poor communities, many of them African Americans, and I was working with the Urban League. That grant could not be moved forward the office was essentially shut down. Do you know what's happening in EPA now? 
Do you know what's happening with the noise department? So I could bring this information. I am probably the one person in this room that is in contact with the only individual at EPA that has any knowledge of noise. She and I have a very strong friendship, which we have forged over the past 12, 15 years. So as we move forward, I would like to work with you. And maybe we could, oh, let me just say one thing. I have a children's book, Listen to the Raindrops. Yes, it singles out the noises, but it focuses on the good sounds. But let me tell you, airplane noise and construction noise are here. DEP has now put a noise curriculum on, on site. I've worked closely with them on it. They ask for this, the children's book, and we're going to teach children about the beauty of sound, the harshness of noise. And if I can quote from a 1968, 1968 Star Trek, Star Trek episode, it was entitled, And the Children Shall Lead. Maybe when we educate these young people to protect the sound, they will bring the message home to the older people, their parents, and maybe we will move forward. So I thank you very much and will support you in any way possible. Thank you, Professor. And as a parent of someone, um, my son goes to PS85 in Queens. That is, that was. Son goes to 85? He does. Oh, so you know I was I, there. I know you were there. And I, and I, know, I thank your assembly person so much. She was wonderful. And uh, you know, I, f I fund the program through the CUNY Law Center that you know, works on the comic book that deals with noise issues and tries to educate about the environment. So I, I, you know, I've, I know this, this all too well, and this is not peace. Um, this is everyone has to be quiet. I know. <laughs> Oh, I, did we? Did I see you there? I, you probably I, did. I, okay. I, I maybe wasn't dressed like this. I go to okay. when I go to PS eighty five. I, I try to dress down a little bit. But look <laughs> how long it took. My study was done forty years ago, and only last year did we get the air conditioning. Even though the rubber resilient pads were in effect. They weren't strong enough. Did it take that? They many just did years? a big construction project, MTA, uh, through the, out the entire month of August. So I am looking to hear the measurements and see. They they have postulated that this has solved the problem. Um, I am not of the mind yet that it has. You need my help. I've been a consultant to the <laughs> MTA to the TA on noise. Uh, I look I forward to sitting down with you then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And 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 of course, uh, I know. Warren and Susan, and, and thank you for your testimony. Then I know we need to do better. I mean, our, our, we've taken some steps. This resolution is a step forward. We want to make sure we get it passed. Um, but really, it's about making uh, the, the federal administration is dismantling the EPA every day. They're, they're, they're appointed someone to run the EPA who does not believe the EPA should exist. Sure. <laughs> so Don't even ask. Um, they are going to continue to sort of take away our ability um, to work with the EPA on these issues. So unless we amplify our, our cries to Washington, uh, we have good representatives, but we need to work with them and help them get their, their our noise heard in other parts of the country um, where you know, right now they need to hear us as well. So I, I know we have a good partnership together. We've worked together. And um, I know that our communities are under siege when it comes to noise, especially airplane noise. And, um, I'm looking forward to working with you guys and seeing what else you can do, because this is our second hearing on airpoint-related noise that we've had. Um, last time was on helicopters. And you know, too often I know in a story as well, the Uber helicopter. You know, my, you know, they, they, they charter these, air, these helicopters to go from the airport to the Hamptons, so they don't have to drive. They don't have to, you know, they don't have to drive out there. They can just fly straight over, so I, I recognize the noise from helicopters as well. Um, so I know that's something we have to do. I mean, I'm, I could ask questions. I mean, I know that, has the FAA even sort of engaged with you in a meaningful way what, during the round tables, or is it really just the port that is, is sort of being responsive? The, um, uh, the, the FAA, their, their advisory members of the round table 
they have told us that they can't actually be members per se. Um, they will usually um, attend our meetings. Mm -hmm. They'll sometimes make um, presentations, um, tell us why certain flight paths are in place. Um, what, what happens though very often, and, and, I, and I, I guess a lot of agencies are like this, and for the FAA it's particularly easy. They'll use a lot of technical jargon that nobody understands, and um, they'll talk about uh, uh, flight paths and different procedures that are in place, and um, uh, sometimes I think they do that intentionally so that we won't know what they're talking about, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> sort, of a, it's, it's sort of a smoke screen. But the, the important thing is always that we do have a dialogue with them. Mm -hmm. They do come to our meetings. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, they are, of course, at the Part 150 um, studies. Um, Will anything come of it? Um, nobody, nobody knows. One of the things that bothered me about the, um, the Part 150 study, and I'm a member of the Techni Technical Advisory Committee, and also Marilyn Chapiteau is with us. She's a member of the uh, Technical Advisory Committee. Um, where Part 150 studies have been done in other locations throughout the United States, some of them going back as far as 20 years ago, and the noise exposure maps were created, the mitigation has still not been completed. Um, so to me, that, that's unacceptable. If you're going to go to all this expense, you're going to spend $8 million for the study, and then 20 years later, uh, people are still waiting for the mitigation and for some relief, and that's um, something that the, um, the city council might want to get involved in. And, um, you know, work with the, um, the FAA and the Port Authority to see if they can speed up that process once the study is completed. May I just add, as far as the schools are concerned, the FAA spent several hundred million dollars to abate the noise at the schools. And uh, two years ago, well, I think it's about a year and a half ago, the study in which we looked at the impact after the schools were abated and you could guess the results. But anyhow, what the FAA needed to do was conduct a study to see if they abated the noise at the schools, the children would benefit. I would have said save the money, just go with the abatement. But the Academy of Sciences uh, did look at that study, and I served on that committee at the Academy of Sciences, so I could speak to the fact that the FAA did spend several hundred million dollars including a number of schools in the New York area, I do have the list at home if you were interested, and which they did move more quickly to abate the noise at schools. So that I know they did do, and we looked at the impact on the children after the abatement. Mm -hmm. Can Susan? I add something? Sure. Um, sorry, getting back to the Part 150. Um, another way for the City Council to be proactive, now the study of course is still ongoing, but um, a number of suggestions for noise abatement were already put forth both by the public and by the Aviation Department of the Port Authority. And based on the documents from the last TAC meeting, the FAA has already rejected the great majority of them, citing complex airspace. Now, it's my understanding that um, as the process goes forward, they're supposed to be more specific about why they rejected proposals. But this is another problem that we're encountering. They don't want to change, and they, they need to come up with better excuses than, I'm sorry, the airspace is complex. You know, they're basically saying, we designed the airspace in 1965, and that's the way it's going to stay. <laughs> so that, that is not acceptable to me and to anybody else here. So I think um, if the city council gets in touch, you know, with the Congress people. I want to find the, I want to find the definition of the word complicated airspace. Yeah, the, it's a, it's a catch-all phrase. And if you go on the Port Authority's website, they have a section on the Part 150 and where you could actually look at the documents from the Technical Advisory Committee meetings, and you'll see what I'm referring to. But, I mean, if the aviation department of the Port Authority, which has extensive knowledge of the airspace, if they're putting forth these proposals, I would think that they have merit. But obviously the FAA disagrees, and so it, it makes me very angry. No, I, I hear you. I hear you. And, and I share your anger. And as uh, I'll let you have the last word. Go ahead. Oh, well, I know there's another bad. panel I, waiting behind others you. Others would be better <laughs> to uh, speak the last word. But I just wanted to give you a slice of my experience at, as a member of the DOT working group for the Brooklyn Bridge Rehabilitation Project. 
I was in meetings with engineers and others, and I asked about the the, imp the impact of this this work on people who lived right around this project. And I was told there were volumes of studies done, and they were traffic flow. And I, my response is the same as what's been mentioned here, that people are needing to be considered. So I said, how many people, uh, who is an expert on the impact of this project on people? And there was silence, because really, as I said before, this was a, a project that didn't require an, an environmental impact statement because it was rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And the New York City uh, noise code couldn't protect us either because uh, it, it, there was a variance for years of after-hours study, after-hours work. Anyway. Just Thanks for the opportunity, and comment. here's the last The one. FAA stands for the Friends of Airlines and Airports. <laughs> Let's know, and, and one thing, in terms of dollars, the TA would never have asked me to be a consultant if I didn't save them dollars while making the system quieter. The one thing that we have to remember when we talk about dollars, it may be that the airlines are so influential because they want to make money but the money that we are spending on the health care of people exposed to aircraft noise and the money that we spent on remediating children who are exposed to noise from trains, from highways, from aircraft, those are dollars. And those are American dollars that are being used for health and for learning. And they readily offset the dollars that the airports are making while by creating this noise. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, last year when we wrote our geothermal legislation, um, for the first time in city history, we wrote in that when the cost-benefit analysis uh, is done relating to whether installed geothermal or, or traditional technology, that the social cost of carbon right. be considered um, as part of that cost-benefit analysis. I think when looking at, at these types of issues, taking in the social cost of these type of what we're what we're as you talked about what we're spending on health care and and right. pollution mitigation and noise mitigation um, in relation to the just the, the bare cost of having to change our ways i think it's going to again demonstrate that we have to do the right thing okay. so I, I appreciate all of your time thank you very and, much and thank you for your testimony warren as always and good to see you and thank you for your time and, and look forward to working with you all thank you all right so our last panel uh, we have uh, Alan uh, Hurstein from Acoustalog, and we have M. Uh, Capital from uh, NY Car. Oh, skip. Okay. Alan Hurstein. Coming. Okay. Yes, sir. If you can sit and be sworn, sir. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I'll tell the truth, nothing but the truth, and I don't think you have time for the whole truth. <laughs> Is that good enough? All right, sir. I'm really disappointed that this councilman and the sponsor have left. I told you on the phone this happened last time. I feel like I'm talking to half half of the people that I need to speak to. Hopefully, you relay this. I'm still here. Still here. I, and you've got a great audience at home. I'm so. not saying you guys are nothing, but he was the sponsor, and you know, my, I know my you bill guys does have most concerns. of the stuff. Well, relay the information. My all, name is Alf. One of the, the other sponsors' bill, all it does is put it online. So the part that does all the stuff that you comment out in the New York Times, I'm here. I'm listening. All right. My name is Alan Firestein. I'm an Acoustic Consultant. I'm the president of Acoustalog Incorporated. I do all the consultations at Acoustalog. I've done it since I founded it 41 years ago. I've been designing electronic equipment for 58 years, 58. I know about electronics, I know about sound, I know about sound measurements, and I know about the noise code. I was involved with it, the, with a lot of parts of it, from Local Law 92 back in, 90, in 
back in the 90s, from 2005, when you guys asked me to help with James Gennaro with the noise code. So I have comments on all three. I presented 20 copies for you. <clears throat> so first, I'm going to talk about 1300, noise mitigation plans. Uh, I support it. Um, I've had to have an attorney and myself call DEP for weeks and weeks and weeks to get someone to come to see if a job had a noise mitigation plan on file. They didn't. They got a violation. It cost my clients thousands of dollars between the lawyer's time and my time, plus they were s staggered with the amount of noise that they had. It could have been eliminated if this stuff was online. The plan has to be effective. It can't just be a plan where they put down some crap that, oh, we're, we're going to use this, we're going to check off these boxes. Have you seen this form? It's like a two-page form where you check off pile drivers, construction. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not reviewed to be effectively. <clears throat> it doesn't require, when you do these forms, that you show readings or photographs proving that the noise mitigation is going to be effective. I didn't say is effective, I say is going to be effective. You don't get a building to permit, permit 30 days after you start construction. You guys want to be flooded with calls because of construction and then you send someone out and you have to wait the 17 days which they euphemistically told you is what it takes. This, months, months. The plan should be approved and reviewed before construction is allowed. That's obvious. And I did a case where a doctor's office, the jackhammering was so loud because the plan was not effective and went to court. The doctors, it was an OBGYN office. It was incredible. You couldn't talk in the examining rooms. But it went to court and the defendants, the people making the noise, it was in Manhattan, said, if you have a plan on file, all other sections of the noise code don't matter. That's ridiculous. Under the current system, there's no teeth to the plan requirement, and it's especially true indoors, because the whole idea of the noise mitigation plan is sort of implies that we're only talking about outdoor noise coming in through people's windows. But that's not just the case. A lot of the time, the noise is occurring in construction, renovation inside apartments, which is go going on in thousands and thousands of apartments all over the city, not just outside construction projects that you see from the street. <clears throat> Even where they have noise mitigation plans, there's, I'm at the top of page two, there's tremendous noncompliance with the basic requirements of simple, simple, stupidly simple things, like having a blanket around a jackhammer when you're jack, jack hammering up the street. That includes whether you're a private contractor or you're working for the city or Con Ed. The blankets are a really good idea. They're very effective, especially for passers-by who get so close that it is ear damaging. The list of equipment that they have that apparently is the only list of equipment that they're concerned with should be amended so that it includes things like, and I list all these different items, drills, not just auger drills, but like a handheld skill or Makita power drill. It can make a lot of noise. You're cutting with a metal saw, you're cutting with a grinder. They're incredibly loud, but they're not on the list. Ordinary hammering, not just jack hammering, ordinary electric saws, not just concrete saws. Have you seen these people doing work on a storefront on, a str on the street? They bring the plywood out onto the street, they set up a couple of saw horses, and they start sawing away and making all this noise using the sidewalk as their workshop. You want to know what makes the city noisy? That's an example. Pickup trucks, not just the other trucks that they mention. Garbage trucks, not just the other trucks that they mention. Dumpsters and containers. They're mentioned in the noise code, but they're not on the noise mitigation plan list. The, the mitigation plan should be reviewed by people with on-hand experience, not just bureaucrats. The contact number that they have on the form doesn't say anything about 24 hours, but it could be a late night construction project. I don't think it says anything about after hours emergency contacts. I'm going to go on to pro proposed 1653, responses to noise complaints. I support it. However, DEP makes almost no visits late at night or on weekends. I get 10, 15 calls from people a week, and I have for the last 41 years uh, from people who have problems, and usually the problems from nightclubs. You guys are asking about nightclubs and music. Is that usually happening during the day? 
No. Is that usually most disturbing to people during the day? No. Most people are not trying to sleep during the day, although they have that right. I get a lot of calls about this. A person called me. I'm going to read it to you so it's on the video record here. I live next to a music on September 13th of this year, two weeks ago, I live next to a music hall which plays loud music at night. I have called 311 and DEP to complain, but to no avail. I'd like to know what other steps I could take. I talked to them on the phone. They said they had to wait six months to get a late night appointment, not 17 days. So <clears throat> you're asking the commissioner to adopt rules. Let me tell you, it said to adopt rules in the noise code in 2005, which went into effect in 2007. A lot of the right rules have not been adopted. <clears throat> you asked them to report the number of violations which are dismissed, but you didn't discuss why they were dismissed. That's important. You'll see why in a second. It's not necessary for a one-year DEP information gathering period because, like you guys were inferring correctly, you know a lot of this stuff already. You don't need the number of 4,000 people complained. Yeah, 4,000 people. One of those people may have been calling for 15 people in that building or have given up. It's like people who've like, dropped out of the workforce. It doesn't necessarily be, get reflected in the employment numbers. The main problem is a lack of qualified inspectors. So in a sense, I'm actually I'm glad that Jerry and everyone left because they get upset when I talk like this. There are not enough inspectors, obviously. They need a couple of hundred inspectors, not 30 or 40, 50 or 60. Um, they're not well trained. People call me all the time and I go in and I testify at the ECB, the Environmental Control Board, where you adjudicate violations that you don't just give up and say, okay, I'm going to play, uh, I'm going to play along and pay my fine. And these inspectors, by and large, do not know how to properly take the measurements. Someone sat here and said they do. They don't. They really don't. If you're invited to come and sit as an interested observer next time I go in in front of tomorrow at the ECB in front of a judge and the inspector is going to be there and we're going to talk about what they did. And I like these guys. They're great guys, but they're not trained properly. They're giving tickets also on unimportant stuff. I was here last year and I was testifying about 186, which says if sound accidentally leaks out through the storefront of a restaurant, not because they're opening the door, not because they have a speaker like Scholastic does on Broadway, deliberately blasting music and sound out onto the sidewalk, if sound accidentally leaks out onto the sidewalk, they give them a ticket. That's ridiculous. That's a waste of inspectors' time. It's a waste of businesses' money. I object to that. And that's a waste of time. And if someone goes in to fight it and the inspector has to be there, those inspector can't be out giving out other violations. Uh, the citizen's complaint. You know how they say, if you see something, say something? There's lots of people out there who could do citizens' complaints, but not with an app like someone suggested about an hour ago. You can't use an app on a phone. They're inaccurate. They're easily fooled. You're not going to start prosecuting people. That's too much of a waste of time. You don't have the time for that. You have to have people who know how to measure properly. But citizens' complaints can be done. But the DEP has this NIH syndrome, not invented here. If we didn't give the ticket, we don't want to do it. Maybe because they have to give some of the fine to the person who makes the citizen comp citizen's complaint. <clears throat> You ask them to report in Section 15 non-violation resolu resolutions to complaints. Now, this is a problem. Now, I realized back in the past, it might have been scary to uh, somebody to say, oh, don't tell the restaurant that I was the one who complained about their kitchen exhaust fan. I don't want them to come up and break my legs. But that doesn't really happen, I don't think, in, in the majority of cases. And when I get called by a restaurant and they say, yeah, someone complained, and I go see this exhaust fan, and the sound could be going east, west, north, or south, and I don't know which way to tell them to put the barrier, and they can't put it on all sides because it's illegal, there's no way to really fix the problem. So they should really at least give some defendant an idea of where the noise generally emanated from, even if they're not giving the complainant's exact name, address, and social security number. Um, in section I-8, they say, you say 5 dBA above the ambient sound level as measured in any residential receiving property dwelling unit. With the windows and doors that may affect the measurement closed, that should be changed to with the windows and doors being open or closed as appropriate. And that's important because if the sound is coming from inside and you're trying to measure inside noise, you open the window that there may be so much background noise coming in through that open window that has nothing to do with the actual problem from the jackhammering going on in the apartment upstairs. 
that you can't get a violation reading because if the jackhammering stops and this noise is still coming in through the window, you may not hear a difference in sound level. The amendment does not differentiate between impulsive and non-impulsive noise in the 5 dBA requirement, and the 5 dBA requirement is too low anyway. If it's a serious problem, it's going to be more than 5 dBA difference over the background noise, if you measure the background noise properly. And you also have to say the sound level attributable to the construction. The people who are making the noise, construction makes noise, let's face it. So you can't just say, okay, I'm going to measure this noise, oh, it went up to 65. Yeah, but some of that was from outside noise. Some of it was from the ambient noise. You have to be fair about that or you're going to be endlessly arguing it. <clears throat> you say residential receiving property dwelling unit. What about offices? You want to work in an office. The code already protects people in 24-232 as uh, has a column for commercial receiving source sources, including offices, and residential. So while the requirements are not as strict for offices, they're still there. And in the definition section of the code, which is 24-203, Receiving property dwelling, receiving property is defined, and it includes offices. Also includes grounds, by the way. Now, uh, oh yeah, and finally, ambient noise, and this is really not finally, I've sent lots and less lists of problems with the code, but the ambient noise has never been clearly and properly defined in the noise code. I can go into that, but it's very technical. Um, resolution 1177. <laughs> Oh, you're I was still just... here, Arlene. Don't get mad at me. Okay, I'm, I'm not in favor of this, and I'm going to tell you why. I think my, my colleague, uh, so, Councilmember Michaelis, wants to quickly sort of talk to you about his legislation before yes. we go on to the next so point. So go right ahead. No worries. Right. So I just wanted to touch base with you on my legislation before uh, I, I have to step out for uh, a 4.30. So um, first, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for your comments in the New York Times. It was... It made the front page of the New York Times with all of us in it, so it was a uh, great story. It actually got more comments than they're used to. Uh, so I guess um, you've given a lot of great feedback on the legislation. If you want to give us specific text, bill text markup, and if you can, can you get it to us by the end of the week? I don't know. I'll try. No, no worries. Uh, I, I like the idea about uh, distinguishing between uh, residential locations and office locations. I think, as you heard from DEP, do you support allowing them to measure from the street? That's a problem. If you're in a high-rise building that's being constructed 37 stories up and you're in a high-rise residence across the street, mm -hmm. down on the street where there's a sidewalk bridge, you're going to measure hardly any noise except the noise from the traffic going but by. They, they would still be able to take it from an apartment if they were able to arrange that, but they'd be able to do so. Um, I guess the other question is perhaps whether or not, uh, I imagine we could add language to say they could take it from the rooftop of, an, of, of a close building so that if you're on the 27th story of another 27th story building across the street, you can measure it that way. Would that be? Uh, it would depend on the situation. I mean, some of this is simple, some of it is complicated. Okay, we, we can put as, as such other locations as the commissioner may determine? Reasonable. Sure. So if, if you have specific locations, because uh, with legislation, I, I know you're a little critical of leaving it to the commissioner, but we try to be as specific as we can. But when you start getting into specific fact patterns of if the noise is occurring from the 27th story of a building, then they shouldn't measure it from the street. They should measure it from another or they, they, they need to fly a drone up or whatever it is. We, we That's when it starts to get into far, very far into the details. So if you have specific uh, questions on that, I think in terms of your concern about the uh, number of inspectors, uh, I think that's part of the budget negotiation. And in all due fairness, I think that we have great commissioners, but at the end of the day, they still work for the mayor. The mayor sets the executive budget. So it's tantamount to going in and asking for a raise. But I think that Everyone at this table from the committee chair to uh, every member of this committee and myself will make sure that in the city council's budget response next year, we are asking for additional uh, uh, inspectors because this is a uh, big issue. Uh, one question I had, so, so we, we changed it from 8 to 5 DPA. Do you think that's the right number or do you think that's 
uh, too high or too low. Five is too low. So you, you like eight. I like seven and I like 10. That's what's in the noise code right now. In well, right, right now it's eight. For what? Uh, above the ambient sound level is measured in any residential receiving property dwelling unit. You mean in your intro? Yes. Yeah, but I'm talking about what's already in the code. What's in the code is eight. You mean for, for unreasonable noise? Yeah, for, for the section in which you're, you're speaking to. Well, I deal most often with unreasonable noise, which is 7 and 10. And I believe in most places in the code, it talks about 7, 10, and 15, 15 for impulsive noise. Okay, and so... There's you not all... much difference between 7 and 8, so it's not worth... I, I believe that it's a, it's a logarithmic value, so... It, there... Very tiny difference between 7 and 8. So, 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 there's no di so there's a tiny difference between, like, 87 dBA and 88 dBA? There's a rule of thumb. If a sound level is three decibels different, the average person can just barely detect that difference, three decibel difference. One is one-third of three. So it's very hard to hear a one decibel change. Would you believe me if I told you I'm one of those people who can hear the in-betweens? Well, fortunately, you're not like everybody, or, you, you know, <laughs> we have a whole city going crazy. My wife asked me to get my hearing tested because I wasn't listening to her enough. And when I did, they turned out that I was, uh, I could hear everything. It was a problem. Uh, okay. Uh, are there any other, any other things specifically to uh, 1653 that you, I think, that you think we may have missed or that you want me to hear while I'm here? I want, some, I want you to see something. Sure. Before you leave. I know you've got to rush out. Yeah. So I'm going to change the order of what I talk about. And I'm just going to show you one quick demonstration. It won't last more than one and a half minutes. Uh, it's up to the chair. All right. I made this yesterday. Just for you. We have a phone. No, it, it's okay. Uh, I, I, I do something called uh, brainstorming with Ben. I had a constituent, I, and it, basically any, cons any of my constituents can come meet with me. Uh, sadly, my district does not take as much advantage of it as people from all over the city. I had a constituent from, I think, Jamani Williams District come and share some technology with me in the same way as we currently have red light cameras, which are sadly regulated by the state, and I would be in favor of putting one on every block in my district as my constituents continue to ask me every day. Uh, is there currently technology that we can mount on intersections that can uh, use multi-directional mics and a battery of mics to identify uh, vehicles w that have uh, excessive noise and attach the speaker to it and identify where it's coming from? No. Okay. There's too many reflections from other cars, from buildings. It would make it difficult to identify the source. You'd have too much fighting going on with lawyers. I want to thank the chair for his indulgence, and uh, if I may be excused, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Councilman Michaelis.
Uh, if you have anything left. Have All right, so can I go with 1177 now? Absolutely. Okay. So I'm not in favor of 1177 because I'm a private pilot, and I know something about aviation. I know something about aviation safety. Planes make most noise when they're taking off. So I wrote down that we want the city to be quieter, but we want it to be safe, too. If you've seen the movie Sully, you know that altitude can be a life-saving, time-saving help. You need full power. You need to f take off into the wind in order for a plane to be safe. And that's important. I know planes make noise while they're landing, but they make more noise when they're taking off. I do know that the FAA takes noise very seriously because their goal is to promote aviation. They don't want to have complaints. They don't want complaints. I am under strict rules about noise mitigation when I fly my plane, and they're in the FARs, the Federal Aviation Regulations. <clears throat> so it's easy to say just lower the noise level, but the runways are aligned in a certain direction. The longest runway at JFK is runway 422. Four means you're taking off or landing to the northeast. 22 means you're landing or taking off to the southwest. 22 means 220 degrees. You drop the last zero. 220 is southwest. You can't change the angle of the runways. You have to come in on final approach in a straight line. If you don't, you're doing a very dangerous maneuver, which planes are not able to do, especially large uh, jets. Um, and then I go into a discussion in here about the problems with trying to enforce a DNL of, 40, of 55, which means basically 45 decibels on average at night. In many areas of New York City, that's not appropriate because there's so much other noise going on. And I would like the planes to be quieter, and the planes have gotten 20 decibels quieter over the last number of years, according to the FAA. Because there's so many other sources of noise, and people here mentioned trains and cars, and we also talked about music and loud nightclubs and construction. If you reduce those, that will reduce the noise overall. It won't, of course, reduce the noise attributable to airplanes, but it will reduce that noise. So I have some suggestions, very quickly, for reducing noise that could otherwise be construed as part of the contribution that planes are contributing to making people not be able to get their sleep or their quiet. <clears throat> First of all, in the 2014 building code, amazingly, the soundproofing requirements were reduced. I wonder whose idea that was. Specifically, the STC and the IIC. These are requirements for soundproofing, for airborne noise, and for impact noise, like people walking on the floor above you. It was reduced. The promised new technology, promised by the mayor in 2005, was never fully adopted, and the inspectors were certainly not trained properly how to use it. I had to do a job where the inspectors came with a meter like this. This is a very expensive meter. They have some. He didn't know how to use it. There were two inspectors. And I said, you've got this set wrong. And they allowed me to reset it for them. The way it was set, it would not have picked up bass. It would not have picked up bass. When I showed this to the inspectors, one of them said to me, well, no, this can't be right, because if this was the case, every nightclub in New York City would be illegal. And I said, you got that right. He was exaggerating, I was too, but not much. <clears throat> I already talked about loud sounds in from cars, but also home theaters and nightclubs. People screaming and laughing late at night in areas like, for instance, Spring Street and Bowery. You go there at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, and there's many areas like this where people come out of a huge collection of bars next to each other. The sound blasting out of the bars is loud. The people screaming and yelling as they come out of the bars. There could be a police officer quieting them down just by their presence. It could happen. There's a way to do it. Um, they ha everyone has a sign. All my clients who are nightclubs have signs that please respect your neighbors. But a sign is not good enough. A large number of cars and road rage and honking. I think I 
I've always supported Mayor Bloomberg's idea for congestion pricing. I drive into the city sometimes. I'd be glad to pay $10 or $15 extra for driving in, knowing that there would be less cars and maybe possibly able to move. <clears throat> Motorcycles and muscle cars showing off with their revved engines, straight pipes, and imp improper mufflers. Um, and finally, people who combine apartments, so often I'm hearing them saying, Look, I bought these two apartments. I'm putting them together. The only place to put this hallway, well, I'm sorry it happens to be this hallway connecting my two apartments is above your bedroom. But I paid $2 million for this apartment, $1.5 million 10 years ago for that apartment. I can do whatever the hell I want. My kids can run around there because it's my apartment. So that's basic in consideration that's causing a problem. I think it needs some public service announcements. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm on page six, and the loud bass music, of course, which is becoming more and more pervasive. And then I discuss the demonstration, which I just showed you. I do want to say, though, that I was taking some notes during the testimony here, and um, you have a limited number of inspectors. I don't want to see them wasting time giving out unimportant violations. They don't always have to be two inspectors. You heard them talk about how they drive to their appointments. It's much more efficient to take the subway sometimes um, until we get this congestion pricing going on. Um, one of the major problems is that, like I said, it says at the end of the construction noise section of the noise code, if there is a construction noise mitigation plan, all other sections of the noise code don't count. The sections with specific decibel limits for garbage trucks, refuse uh, compressors, exhausts, containers, jackhammers, motor vehicles, sound signal devices, everything is superseded by that, which is nuts. It's nuts that that's the case because the plans themselves are not effective enough. So. And the numbers of those sections are sections 24 dash, and I'll read the suffix numbers, 225, 226, 228, 229, 230, 236, 237, and all of those sections superseded because they put that paragraph in there. All you have to do is file this piece of paper, no one really checks it properly, and you're exempt from the noise code for construction. I'm done. Thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate your time. All right, so with that, um, I want to make sure I thank uh, the DEP and DOB for their testimony today and everyone who testified, uh, including uh, I also want to thank my colleagues, both Councilmember Gorodnik and uh, Ben Kalos, uh, for their legislation. Uh, I want to thank, of course, our, uh, our legislative counsel, Samara Swanston, our policy analyst, Nadia Johnson, uh, John Seltzer, our finance analyst, and of course my legislative counsel, Nick Wazowski, and with that we will gavel this meeting of the Environmental Protection Committee closed.